spending part of your Friday with us as we wrap up the week here on CNN Student News. From the CNN Center, I'm Carl Lazus. First up, we are heading to Washington University for a face-off between this year's vice presidential candidates. The St. Louis School has hosted three past presidential debates, but this is the first time that a showdown between VP hopefuls has taken place on campus. University officials said one reason they wanted to host the debate was to give students the feeling of being part of the political process. Susan Rosegen reports on last night's event. It started with a handshake and ended with fundamental differences about how this country should be run. Senator Joe Biden went through the issues in a matter-of-fact way, while Governor Sarah Palin stuck to her folksy style. Darn right we need tax relief for Americans so that jobs can be created here. Now Barack Obama and Senator uh, Biden also voted for the largest tax increases in U.S. history. Barack Obama even supported increasing taxes as late as last year. Charge is absolutely not true. Barack Obama did not vote to raise taxes. The vote she's referring to, John McCain voted the exact same way. It was a budget procedural vote. John McCain voted the same way. It did not raise taxes. Whichever candidate you support, there were plenty of points scored by both. The true win will not be known until November. I talked to at least a dozen people as they were leaving the debate. They all said they enjoyed it, but not one said it changed his or her mind about which candidate they support. For CNN Student News, I'm Susan Rosjen. Today's shout-out goes out to Miss Burns' social studies class at St. Teresa Catholic School in Evansville, Indiana. Which one of these former vice presidents was born in Missouri? If you think you know it, shout it out, is it? Dan Quayle, Harry Truman, Millard Fillmore, or Al Gore? You've got three seconds. Go! Harry Truman, who also served as president, was born in Missouri in 1884. That's your answer, and that's your shout-out. Neither Senator Biden nor Governor Palin hail from Missouri, but soon one of them will be elected vice president. You've heard about their debate. Now use our learning activity to research the views and backgrounds of these VP candidates. It's all waiting for you at CNNStudentNews.com. Next up, the financial bailout is in the House of Representatives. You guys know that the Senate voted on this issue Wednesday night. Now it's time for round two with the representatives. The House rejected the original proposal on Monday, but one congressional leader says this version has a better chance to pass. Nicole Collins has the latest from Capitol Hill. The amendment is agreed to. With a 74-25 vote, the Senate passes its version of a $700 billion financial rescue plan. It was a measure for Main Street, not for Wall Street. We work together for the good of the country. But it's unclear if the House will come to an agreement because of new provisions in the bill, like an increase in the FDIC insurance cap from 100000 to 250000 and tax breaks for individuals and businesses, $110 billion worth added to appeal to Republicans, but that could actually turn Democrats off. Frankly, an awful lot of people are going to look at this bill, not be pleased with what the Senate has done. President Bush says the bill has provisions members of both parties can support. He also said the American people expect the House to pass the bill this week so he can sign it. This issue has gone way beyond uh, New York and Wall Street. This is an issue that's affecting uh, hard-working people. They're worried about their savings. They're worried about their jobs. They're worried about their houses. They're worried about their small businesses. And the House of Representatives must listen to these voices and get this bill passed. The House is expected to vote on Friday, but only if they are certain they have the votes they need to pass this legislation. On Capitol Hill, Nicole Collins for CNN Student News. We've been watching a mystery unravel in the disappearance of Steve Fawcett. Yesterday, we told you about the recovery of several ID cards that had Fawcett's name on them. Authorities now say they've found something much more significant. The wreckage of the plane that the millionaire adventurer was flying when he disappeared last year. Dan Simon has the details on the new discoveries. The crash site is about 12 miles away from where I am standing. There are about 60 crews up there. This is a mystery that had been going on for well over a year. What happened to Steve Fawcett? What happened 
to his airplane. What we now know what happened is a result of a lone hiker finding three pieces of identification that had Steve Fawcett's name on them. There was also $1,000 in cash. Well, that discovery led a new search, and authorities found Steve Fawcett's plane. And looking at that wreckage, they say there is no chance anyone could have survived. That information is indicative of a high impact crash, which appears to be consistent with a non-survivable accident. The NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, is now on the scene investigating what caused this crash to take place. Right now they are taking pictures of the crash site, trying to preserve it, the beginnings of what could be a very lengthy investigation. Hopefully someday they'll figure out what caused this plane to go down. I'm Dan Simon reporting from Mammoth Lakes, California. Good science and good sense. That's the motto for Dr. Antonia Novello, the first woman and first Hispanic to serve as U.S. Surgeon General. When her tenure began on March 9th of 1990, Dr. Novello worked to curb underage drinking and smoking, and she paid particular attention to the health of women, children, and minorities. After she left the Surgeon General job in 1993, Novello became a special representative for UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund. In 1999, Dr. Novello was appointed New York State's Health Commissioner. Celebrating the life and achievements of Dr. Antonio Novello, this Hispanic Heritage Month. Okay, switching gears here. Imagine having the same teacher every day for every class, every year. That might be tough on some teachers, too, and that's what's going on at a school in Iran. Of course, it helps when you can count the total number of students on one hand. Asiye Namdar visits what could be the smallest school on the planet. Four young students and one very dedicated teacher. This is perhaps the world's smallest school in the southern Iranian town of Kalu on the Persian Gulf. Population 34. In fact, it's so small you can't even find it on Google Map. It's 70 miles from Boucher, where Russia is helping Iran build a nuclear power plant. But in this fishing village, no one is talking about Iran's standoff with the West. Chances are, no one cares. It was 21-year-old teacher Abdul Muhammad Sherani who put this tiny school on the map through his blog. A friend in Australia created an English version for the world to see. The school is now recognized by UNESCO as the world's smallest. Sharani chose this because he could make a real difference. And he already has. Meet Hamideh, Parisa, Mehdi and Hossein. Their faces filled with hope and big dreams for the future. Life in Iran can also be filled with fear and uncertainty. When a package arrived from the U.S., 10-year-old Hossein was terrified. He thought it was a bomb. There were chocolates. The gift gave Sharani the chance to talk to the kids about the world. He told them governments are different from people. Because of worldwide publicity, the classroom now has all the basics. The broken desks have been replaced by four new ones. There's even a computer donated by the local Ministry of Education. When he was asked about his dreams for the future a few years ago, Sharani said he wanted to be a teacher in a far-flung village. Looks like he's living the dream. Asiye Namdar, CNN, Atlanta. Okay, before we go, how do you know you are like this super awesome mega celebrity? Well, when your likeness is carved into a corn maze, it's a pretty good indication. Muhammad Ali won Olympic medals, boxing titles, even had a movie made about his life. But having a field fashioned into your face is still kind of cool, especially when it backs up your boxing boasts. The former champ famously referred to himself as the greatest of all time. These crops are crafted to concur. It's an amazing image that makes for one corny ending. I wonder how many of y'all saw that coming. Anyway, we hope to see you again on Monday. For CNN Student News, I'm Carl Wilson.